I'm Sue. I'm going to be your instructor during this iCal Compost Masterclass. Strap yourselves in and get ready to have loads of fun. So what exactly is thermophilic compost? Our thermophilic compost method entails deliberately decomposing dead organic matter in the presence of oxygen, so aerobe conditions, and reaching hot temperature thresholds of over 55 degrees centigrade. Good quality thermophilic composting results in a high presence of diverse soil microbes and metabolites that we regenerative farmers use to inoculate and regenerate our soils and revitalize our crops. You can use your compost in different ways, as a solid compost, as an extract or as a tea. Um, remember, it is an inoculation of soil microbes, so your fungi, your protozoa, your nematodes, uh, your bacteria, um, if you don't have good levels, if you don't have good balance in your compost, your original compost, you won't get the good balance in your teas or your extracts. So it's fundamentally important to get your compost, solid compost made extremely well um, and with very good um, and balanced microbial diversity. Composting is like cooking. You're going to need um, a good working environment, a good recipe, quality ingredients, great execution of that recipe, the right temperatures and moisture, of course, mixing when required, and then of course, settling before consumption. So you're gonna to want to make your compost in a cool place that is protected from wind, from rain, from too much sun. Um, you want your compost piles to be made close to where there's water, and also close to where you're gonna be using them so that you don't have to be trudging your ready-made compost over long distances. So we're making our compost to grow microbes, in particular our bacteria, our fungi, our protozoa and our nematodes. When we look at why we're doing it, it could be because of our next desired crop based on the um, succession um, and the fungal to bacterial ratio, um, but it could be also because our plants are suffering from, from pests and diseases, um, which indicate that our soils are missing um, a good solid soil food web um, balance. And speaking of balances, in order to get the bacteria, the fungi, the nematodes and the protozoa into our compost, we need to make sure that we're giving them the right food. It's their party, right? So we start off with a party food, um, which is to encourage the bacterial activity. Um, the bacteria come in and chomp on that very high nitrogen um, bacterial food and in the process multiply and drive up temperatures uh, very steeply. Um, in the process also, they begin to consume a lot of oxygen um, and that's why when we reach some of those temperatures we need to turn the pile to bring oxygen back in but also to change the sides and the other materials and bring them um, into the mix. It's the core of the compost that will actually have that uh, be like the furnace, the furnace of the compost. Um, the green materials um, are burned slower so they keep the temperatures right up in the thermophilic phase that we want. We want three turns at above 55 degrees um, and we'll talk about those thresholds later. Um, minimum of three turns in the throughout the duration of making the compost. And as the compost cools down, the other uh, microorganisms will come in to predate on the bacteria and we'll see the amoeba and the nematodes and also the fungi, etc., cetera, um, levels growing. Um, so the fermethylic stage is really just to make sure that we kill all pathogens in all the materials and um, in all the, you know, the sides, the top, the bottom of the pile, and that we kill any um, seeds that might be in there as well. Our recipe will be 10% party food, 30% greens, and 60% high carbon or browns. For the party food, it's really important that it's high in nitrogen. So we're looking at things like, um, if you look at, for example, a maize cob and cow manure, your cow manure has more, much more nitrogen in it than a maize cob. So when we look at the list of our party foods, manures are high in those lists and all of the manures have different relative amounts of nitrogen. It's advisable to work with the manures that are closest to you. A, it's going to be more, much more cost effective and also you're going to have biology that is um, native to your area. You can see that horse manure has less nitrogen than say chicken manure. I mean, you also find that you might have some high nitrogen um, ingredients around you that are not on the list. For example, I use black soldier fly frass, which has got a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio. 
Um, what I advise you to do is have a look on the internet and you'll be able to look at those carbon to nitrogen ratios. And typically you're trying to look at things that are have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of less than 10, um, less than 15, maybe 15 to 1, 10 to 1, something like that will give you um, a, um, yeah, some good party food. For your greens, you're looking for a carbon to nitrogen ratio of on average around 30 to 1. It could be higher, right up to even 500 to 1. But what you're looking for um, essentially are materials that have got greens in them. You can also use in your greens um, compost that has failed, so spent compost piles and a bunch of other things including your kitchen waste from your, your kitchen, your green waste from your kitchen. But typically your greens can be your weeds, your green grasses, your um, garden waste, your vegetable waste, um, yeah, fresh stover, maize stover, as long as it's looking green, um, is lush and a little bit green. You can count those, consider those as your greens. So green grass that has dried as green but has now gone a strawy-ish colour but with tinges of green in it is still con considered green. The nitrogen was still in it, it was still um, a more of a green um, input than if it had dried for example like straw dried in the field and gone through senescence. So think about that when you're thinking about your grasses. Uh, when you harvest them you don't want to put them in a big pile because they heat up just so very quickly but you can lay them out and let your grasses dry as green and still store them then dried and use them as green. Your browns generally are very high in carbon so those are either plants that have dried so may stover that may have dried would be considered a brown um, wood, wood chips, twigs, cardboard, paper, straw, all of those materials that have gone through their growth period or are just very high in lignin and in carbon. There are a few considerations you want to take about the ingredients that you're using, so let's look at party food first. Uh, what is a carbon to nitrogen ratio of the party food that you're thinking of using? Um, if you don't know, have a good look on the internet, there's plenty of information there. Um, what was the animal's diet? An animal that is fed on grain will have a higher um, carbon to nitrogen ratio, more nitrogen in the end product than an animal that is not fed on grains. It will be more party foodish. Um, how fresh is the manure? Old manure has got, is less party food than um, fresh manure. Um, your bacteria won't have such a big party in old manure. What's the likelihood of dewormers? So dewormers will affect the nematodes and you want nematodes to grow their part of the soil food web. Uh, what is the likelihood of antibiotics? That will also affect the organisms because antibiotics actually are there to kill bacteria and to kill uh, microbes. Um, what is the likelihood of any other contaminants, sprays, etc. And then finally considering the denseness of the weight um, of your party food. An example is um, something like um, horse manure versus black soldier fly frass. A bucket of horse manure and a bucket of black soldier fly frass it might both be in terms of volume the same. The black soldier fly frass will be much denser, much heavier um, and when I use it I use it sparingly so I use 5% of black soldier fly frass and then increase um, the um, carbon by an extra 5%. So um, you might, you don't want your compost pile to fire up and keep burning away over a long period of time because you'll have to keep breaking it down to stop it um, becoming anaerobic, um, running out of oxygen um, and it'll be a lot of labour and a lot of work. So let's look at our considerations for greens. We want to know how old is the green material, how long has it stayed, how long since it was harvested. A very young, um, say, clippings of a lawn versus long grass um, that has already seeded versus grass that has still got the seed in the in the stalk. Each of those will have different reactions in your compost pile so you can practice with the different materials you have and see how they contribute to the long burn. It'll be based on those um, differentials. Um, could there be contaminants in the materials, pesticides, etc.? Um, how quickly will they heat up um, if they're left in a pile? So sometimes you can use that as an indicator if you want to know if your grass is going to be good in keeping that slow burn, put it in a pile and see what kind of energy it has in it in terms of you know, its heating capacity. Um, sometimes you can put your grass in a pile and within a few hours it's, the temperatures are really, um, really high. I had mine going up to 65 degrees just within a day. Um, are they cut up enough or will they take a long time to break down? Yeah, so make sure that your materials are cut down so that um, the microbes can um, get at them um, easier. 
At the same time, you don't want the grass to be clumping up. And that's why I say when you're mixing your grass in your pile, mix it in um, as a dry material so you can fluff it around and it isn't all clumping together. When you get your grasses and things or leaves clumping together, um, they can very quickly turn a pile or create anaerobic pockets in a pile uh, because the oxygen can't get through um, the microbes uh, that will survive in those conditions will be the anaerobes and we don't really want them. So finally looking at the brown materials and the conditions we need to, to, to look out for, how dry are they, how much soaking is needed. Remember your compost pile is going to take a few months to break down. Um, if you don't have your materials saturated enough with enough water in them at the 50% which we'll talk about, um, then they will dry in the middle and um, they won't, the microbes won't grow. So how dry are your browns to begin with because that will um, influence how much soaking is needing. Could there be contaminants in the materials, pesticides, etc.? Are you using wood that has been treated? Not good. Um, are they the right size to encourage porosity? So your browns actually bring in um, two aspects, not only fungal food, but also aeration because the, the, you don't want to have finely ground sword dust or wood shavings. You want to have wood chips so that as they're moved around, as they're turned around, they also create a fluffier and more breathable uh, if that's the right word to use, uh, compost. And then you want to know that they're not too dense also, as I've just said, that they could cause anything like um, anaerobic pockets, as I've explained also uh, with the clumping of grasses. Super, so we're finally at the recipe stage. We're going to do a 47 by 20 litre recipe. Um, that'll give us about 940 cubic litres. Um, the 10% will be 4.7 buckets of party food, 14.1 buckets of green, and 28.2 buckets of browns. Get your materials weighed out, get them ready, put them on the side before you go on to the next steps. The day before you make your compost, make sure that you make your cage so that you're not faffing and trying to get that done all at the same time. It's a lot of work, as I've said before. If you don't know how to make the cage, just go back to our um, lesson before this, the introductory to this composting masterclass. The evening before you make your compost, soak all your brown materials. So take all your wood chips, all your cardboard, or whatever the materials are that you're using that are brown, and soak them. I put mine into a bath of water, I completely drown them. Um, I do the same thing with my straw. I put the straw into water, step on it, um, mush it down and, and leave it overnight from 6 p.m. Um, until early morning, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. I chuck away the water from the straw, by the way, because I don't know where it was produced and it could have um, inherent pesticides that I don't want to bring into my pile. So I also use this as a method of rinsing out any potential pesticides in the, um, in the straw. On the day of making your compost, you've got three things to do. Try and do them in this order. Get all your dry materials out of the water and let them drain. So just put them on the grass on the side or I put them on a plastic sheeting and let them drain. Um, I then start getting my greens ready, either um, raking those up that I've cut and had um, naturally dried out in the field rather than in piles, or I start mowing the grass or getting my, chopping up my, if I'm using maize stalks or anything, chopping them up then into smaller bits and pieces. Um, and then um, take your, um, your party food and pour some water in it and bring it up to about a 50% wet sort of like slurry. Now divide all of the materials into four. You're going to be mixing in batches of four. A, this will be less labor intensive than trying to mix the whole lot in one go, but it will also help you to get more uniformity across the entire compost pile. You're going to have 1.2 buckets of party food, 3.5 buckets of greens, and 7 buckets of browns for each of your batches. Put them all into your trough or all into the area that you're going to mix them. So now is a real critical time. You need to bring your batch 1 up to a moisture level of about 50%. So to measure that 50%, you'll be adding in water incrementally, slowly, slowly, as you mix and turn and get all of those ingredients mixed into a lovely homogenous mix. You'll take a handful of the compost out and squeeze it. At 50%, you'll see a few drops appear just between your fingertips. 
If they drop and you get a lot of drops falling from your hand, that is well above 50%. And if there is no liquid at all that seeps through your fingers there into that one drop, your um, compost is a little bit too dry. Keep adding water incrementally until you get it as close to that 50% as you possibly can. Take your first batch and fill it into the cage that you've got ready and um, continue the process with the next three batches until you've filled it up to the top. Um, composting is really hard work, so get some help to um, make sure that you keep that consistency throughout the whole process. Once your compost cage is full to the top, wrap the cage um, with some shade net to keep the moisture in, keep the wind out. Um, put a thermometer in and take your first reading and put a, a peg with an ID in it so that uh, in case you're making more than one compost you don't mistake which is which. Then take some plastic or some tarpaulin, put it across the top to stop anything getting into the compost pile, anything falling from above or any rain. At this point as well you'll also want to put a band around to hold the plastic down so that it doesn't get blown off and you might want to put um, your pull up your, your thermometer it will act as a uh, temp the plastic a little bit so that if it does rain the rain will just run off. And that's it. Next up, record keeping.